Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners. Today I thought I would respond to some of your emails. I have a lot of your emails here, and it's spring, so I thought I'd do some spring cleaning and actually answer all the emails that I have left from the patrons. Because, as Marie Kondo would say, it sparks joy to review these emails, to look at them, and to answer them. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, a professor, and someone who misquotes Marie Kondo. This first email is from an, an anonymous patron. It's about kleptomania. She writes, I've been wanting you to do a deep dive on kleptomania and shoplifting for the longest time, and I finally decided to write in. Uh, she describes her history with uh, shoplifting and whatnot. She says, you know, if I'm going to be honest, I have a personal history with shoplifting. Okay, so let's talk about kleptomania here first off. Kleptomania is the inability to refrain from the urge to steal things. And this urge to steal things is independent from the item's material val value. In other words, people with kleptomania they steal even though they don't need it. And a lot of times people with kleptomania will steal things and they'll just like give it away or throw it away or something. It's more about the stealing than it is about the item, right? And people with kleptomania prior to stealing, they'll have a building sense of distress that the only relief to it is if they steal something. And then after they steal something, they often feel quite busted up about it, a lot of self-hatred and a lot of guilt. So it's basically a compulsion and it's not really a choice. And it's not something that people do, um, you know, with a lot of happiness, shall we say. It's, it's done as a compulsion, the same way that someone might have a compulsive behavior around gambling or a compulsive behavior around masturbation or alcohol or heroin or something like that they you know you have this building sense of of like you know okay i have this urge to do this but i don't want to i have this urge to do this but i don't want to there are consequences i you know i've told myself i'm gonna not do this anymore and then it just more and more distress more and more distress and then finally it's just like screw it i'm just gonna do it and the brain will make up all these excuses you know like this is a large corporation. Target has insurance for this sort of thing, or, you know, I, I deserve it or whatever. There's lots of different justifications that the brain will produce to allow for the itch to be itched. Also, uh, research shows that the ratio between men and women is it's a three to one ratio, women over men. Uh, and I might get into why that is. So, so anonymous patron, when she wrote in, um, I, I was trying to figure out like, okay, well, what is she talking about when she's talking about kleptomania? And what, what is she talking about when she's talking about her own shop, the shoplifting? Um, because when people shop shoplift, we often say, oh, it's kleptomania because it sounds snappy, right? It, it there's a lot of different things like this. It's like, Oh, I have a reaction from trauma. Oh, it must be PTSD. Or, oh, I had an anxiety episode. Oh, it must be panic attack or something. And it's like, no, it, it, it's possible it's that, but it's also possible that it's not. So just because someone is thieving things chronically, it doesn't mean that it's kleptomania. In fact, it often isn't. In fact, of those who are caught for shoplifting, what percentage do you think would be diagnosed as having kleptomania. I, I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. It is 4%, according to some research. So very few people who are caught shoplifting, and by caught, it's likely that you've been doing it a lot, right? Uh, at least we could say that the more often one does it, the more likely they are to get caught. And so only 4% of those people, that means 96% of people who are caught shoplifting do not qualify for the label of kleptomania. So there are many other causes, social and psychological, that can result in people thieving, like poverty, for example, if you're starving or something, then you might steal things. 
uh, immaturity. You're young. A, a lot of youth will steal things. I stole things when I was four years old. I remember stealing a Jolly Rancher from the bulk bin at the grocery store and felt horrible about myself. <laughs> I, I At the age of four, I also stole my good friend's matchbox car, even though I had the exact same one. And I was totally regretting it and feeling terrible about myself. And then my mom noticed and said, well, just give it back to him. And I just like, oh my God, my mom's a genius. All my guilt will go away if I just give this matchbox car back. And I did. And my friend was like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> so I learned my lesson is that, you know, go ahead and steal everything because no one cares. No, I learned my lesson that guilt is not worth it. A lot of us learn that anyway. So there's a lot of different social causes and other kinds of causes and a lot of psychological causes like antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy. These people are selfish. They lack respect for rules. They lack empathy for others. They lack remorse. And so they will tend to steal just because they want, they want something and they're going to take it. So kleptomania people will steal out of a compulsion and they actually don't necessarily want it. And, Antisocial people will steal because they want it and they don't really care about the consequences. And they might not actually be afraid of the consequences. But most often in my experience, when someone comes to me and they are talking about a chronic shoplifting problem, in my experience, it's almost always passive aggressive personality disorder or they are on the spectrum thereof. I've done a deep dive on passive aggressive personality disorder. If you become a patron, you can listen to that whole thing. It's not in the DSM anymore, but it still exists just because the DSM doesn't uh, talk about it anymore doesn't mean it just disappeared from the human population. Essentially, for people with passive aggression in their childhood, they experience abusive and distant parents. This results in attachment injuries, of course. And the child has, given their disposition and given the way that they're being treated, the child early in life develops a a sense that life is deeply unfair and that they're being treated unfairly. That's a key part of the development of passive aggression is that you, and by, when I say passive aggressive personality disorder, I'm using it in the clinical sense, not in the colloquial or the common sense that it's used. People often bastardize the term passive aggression. And so I won't go into the details on that, but it's uh, something much different than that. But anyway, so the child grows up being mistreated somehow, often by parents that are being abusive and or distant. And the child feels that life is deeply unfair and that they're being treated unfairly. Well, what happens when children feel that they're being treated unfairly? Well, they get angry, right? Well, anyone, that's adults too. When, when someone does something wrong to us, then we get angry about that. It's justifiable, right? And so the child, due to their mistreatment, it concludes that life is unfair and they're being treated unfairly and they're deeply, deeply angry about it because it's justified. But somehow because of the mistreatment that they're going through, the expression of the anger is somehow completely not allowed. And so, um, you know, either from abuse, you know, when they, the child expresses their anger, they're abused even harsher or their parents completely withdraw from the child or they abandon the child or through socialization of gender. So this is where the, the, the woman thing comes into play here is that women are more likely to be socialized to not express their anger. And so that could also be a factor. So they're deeply angry. Life is deeply unfair to them because it is, and their anger is justified, but they learn that they can't express their anger in any kind of normal, healthy way, outward way. So the child learns that they have to express their anger passively, hence the term passive aggressive, passive aggression, passive ag aggressive. And so you're, they're aggressive, meaning angry and hostile, but it's passive, meaning that it's covert and hidden. And common passive aggressive behaviors are angry journaling. I'll see this. People will retreat to their journal, whether it's online or paper or otherwise, and they will just angrily rail on everyone in their life. And their journal is just filled with insults and anger. And but in but in real life, in you know, to everyone else, they seem like they're very nice people. So that's another thing is that because they learn that they have to suppress all their anger, often, depending on the level of pathology, often 
they come across like they're the nicest, softest people on the planet. Sometimes they can be what I would call aggressively nice. I know people with passive aggressive personality disorder personally who are aggressively nice, meaning that they're super nice to you and you just feel like it's like invasively nice to you. Um, that's not always a sign of passive aggressive personality, but it, it can be. But anyway, so outwardly, they're very nice, but inwardly, they're very angry and very upset. And so journaling is a good way to do that. Also, other passive aggressive things that I've seen are hacking into other people's computers, breaking into their houses secretly, a lot of secret stuff, stuff that people you can get away with. People with passive aggressive personality are often quite secretive, not all the time. And also chronic thieving. This is a very common thing. Uh, when the pa anonymous patron wrote in, I immediately thought, oh, I wonder if this is, uh, I wonder if this is passive aggressive personality because almost all the time when I see someone telling me that they have a problem with thieving, then I, upon further investigation, discover that uh, this conceptualization of passive aggressive personality rings true. Also, chronic cheating, chronic infidelity can also be a behavior to passively communicate your anger. Now, of course, none of this is functional, right? Because if they were angry and being treated unfairly, they should just go to the person and say, you're treating me unfairly and I'm angry at you and I need you to stop doing that. But instead, because of their early programming and their neuronal pathways that were developed through repetitive use, they learn that in order to express their anger, they have to, they can't do it uh, directly. They have to do it passively and they will do it. So if they're really angry at their spouse, for example, they might cheat chronically as a way to get back and as a very dysfunctional way of expressing their anger. Now, of course, if you asked the passive aggressive person, why are you cheating? They just, they would say that they might be confused about it or they're attracted to the other person or they feel so distant from their spouse that it just doesn't feel like it's that big of a deal. But when you get into it and you go deeper, they discover, oh, I'm, I actually, yeah, whenever I had a strong urge to cheat, that was, uh, that was preceded by a event with my spouse in which I felt very hurt. And I guess I felt angry, but um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of the anger because I'm never aware of my anger because I learned when I was a child, I had to suppress my anger. So thieving and cheating and angry journaling are very common things. Sneaking around at night, just literally sneaking around, getting into people's backyards, uh, just that sense of I'm going to sneak around and invade other people uh, as a passive aggression on the world credit card fraud or um, taking out credit cards in other people's names. Um, that obviously can be a part of some other compulsion, but also secret rebellion. So when people are teens, they're naturally rebellious uh, for the most part, and even in, in people's 20s. And if you have no ability to be healthfully, healthfully rebellious in the healthy ways by asserting your own selfhood, then you might have to turn to secret ways of being rebellious. And there are a lot of ways to secretly rebel as a child. You can secretly use drugs. You can secretly do bad at school. You can secretly have sex at night. All these things are passive ways at getting back at one's parents and society and that kind of thing. You can date people that your parents disapprove of, all these kinds of things. And the, the list just goes on and on, but those are the common ones that I've experienced. And of course, none of this works to actually assert one's anger, which is a reflection of their needs. And the person ends up not having any of their needs met, not, have, not being able to express any emotion at all, really, that, that they believe other people will receive. And all this makes the person feel more worthless, more unseen, and they often can become quite depressed and even suicidal. So I asked her if, uh, you know, I, so I sort of distilled this down and I asked her if she had any attachment injuries growing, cause you know, originally all she asked me was, can you talk about kleptomania? Cause I have a problem shoplifting. So I asked her if she had any attachment injuries from her early childhood. I also asked her about how she expresses anger 
and I asked her about materialism because uh, that's so that's another thing that can happen that can uh, sort of push the passive aggressive into a shoplifting behavior in that when you're growing up, if your parents give you a lot of um, material goods instead of love, then you can associate items, getting items with love. And so therefore, when you're feeling unloved, you can sort of turn to material goods as a way of uh, trying to find love in the world. And of course it doesn't work, but that's the compulsion. So I asked her about materialism growing up. And I also asked her about her sense of fairness growing up. Cause again, that's the key. That's the, that's the foundation. That's the beginning of passive aggressive personality in the same way that abandonment is the key and the foundation for developing borderline. So she said, I was adopted at the age of one and I don't know who my birth parents are. So let's just chime in there. That's a massive attachment injury. She doesn't know who her birth, birth parents are. I would guess that her parents had issues with substances and the child was taken away from them. Who knows? But that's often the case, especially when you're looking at a child that was adopted at the age of one and doesn't know who their birth parents are. So from that, we can imagine that the child, she, as a child, experienced maybe some intense, intense attachment disruptions and injuries before the age of one. And then being adopted at the age of one is also a massive attachment change, which can cause all sorts of issues. She goes on, my mother was very angry. So this is her adopted mother. My, my adoptive mother was very angry and sullen when I was growing up and my dad was distant due to working all the time. My mom was often angry and emotionally abusive, and she was physically abusive sometimes too. I grew up very angry. As I got older, my anger became depression, so I just suppressed my anger and didn't deal with it. My parents would definitely replace love with material possessions, especially because my dad was away so often. One of the ways he was able to show love without a without a real time commitment was to give me toys. I think ultimately I did grow up feeling deprived. I also had this sense that life was ridiculously unfair. It felt like life was meant to punish me. So, wow, right? Like hits the, hit the nail on the head there, right? I mean, all the things that I see in passive aggressive personality in terms of the experience and the defense and the worldview is all there, right? So I wrote um, that I was really sorry that she went all th went through that because it sounds awful. And then I wrote, I've seen that before. Abusive mom, distant dad, attachment injuries, depression, suppressed anger, which results in dependency issues and passive aggressive thieving. The way I see it, when we have no trust that others will accept our anger, we need a way to express it through punk rock, secret rebellion, boyfriends our parents don't like, thieving, journaling, infidelity, etc. Does that resonate? And she wrote, I did experience some of those things like secret rebellion, journaling, and obviously thieving. I think my current attachment style has kept me away from things like dating people or infidelity because I'm so distrustful of others that I don't even think about dating. In the case of secret rebellion, I did a lot of drinking and even drugging even escalating to meth abuse and addiction by the age of 15. I'm clean and sober now, but I definitely struggled for years to quit abusing substances. So I wrote back and again, was very sorry for the amount of suffering she went through. She didn't deserve any of that. It sounds awful. And it sounds like she has risen above it for the most part, but still has some symptoms, which totally makes sense. And so I said that the thieving is probably a symptom of her recovery from the abuse. Um, so the, the, she also asked in her original email, like, how do you, how do you treat this? Well, in order to heal from her attachment, because the, the way that I see it is her thieving is an outgrowth of her attachment injury and her uh, learned her, you know, justifiably learned viewpoint that anger is bad. She has to suppress it and she can't express it because no one will actually accept it or she's going to be abused if she does express it. 
and that people should be avoided, right? That relationships, close relationships should be avoided. And until, she, and so she's walking around all day long with this uh, childhood chronic feeling of unfairness and therefore anger. And also she's, as an adult, being treated unfairly, I'm sure at times, and feeling like the world is treating her unfairly and, and that produces more anger. And without any neurological healthy process of interpreting those situations and expressing anger relationally in a healthy way, the passive aggressive urge is always going to be there, whether it's thieving or something else, it's always going to be there. And so I wouldn't say, okay, let's attack the thieving because the symptom will just move somewhere else. And so the key is, is to heal from your attachment injuries and also to learn through experience how to interpret the world in a healthy way and how to express your anger in a healthy way. For example, so all this is done in therapy, obviously. It'd be be really hard to do this on your own. I can't imagine. So you'd have to find a specialist, which there aren't many, I'm going to (laughs) say. Um, but, uh, cause you couldn't just go to a CBT therapist or a family therapist randomly. Like you'd have to find someone that understood what I'm saying, at least on some level. And so when you have that secure attachment with the therapist, you're going, you're going to feel occasionally mistreated by the therapist. And that's going to make you feel like the therapist is treating you unfairly, which you're very sensitive to. And so you're going to be angry about that. And you're going to have an urge to express that anger. And since you have this repetitive neuronal pathway of expressing it passively, you're going to express it passively with that therapist. You might show up late. You might cancel. You might not pay on time. You might, um, I don't know, try to break into their um, account. I mean, you know, this could go pretty far. You might take something from the office as a way of getting back with that therapist. You might quote unquote cheat on your therapist by seeing another therapist. All that will be urges that you'll have. And with a specialist, you will be able to talk with the therapist about that and they'll be able to say, well, great, I'm glad you told me. So a sort of perfect scenario is Um, after six months of developing a strong enough relationship, you start having enough transference onto the therapist that they are uh, your parent, you know, essentially you've transferred your issues with your parents onto your therapist. And you start noticing that you have an urge to, for simplicity's sake, let's just say thieve something from your therapist's office or waiting room or lobby or something. And you know to say that you say, so my issue is coming up. Uh, I am because of something you said last week, I've been really angry at you this past week and, or upset. At least I think I'm upset because, um, I have certain markers that sort of, uh, give me the tip of the iceberg. I know most of my anger is underneath there somewhere that I don't have access to, but it's somewhere. And so I have, I think as a result, I've been like fantasizing about uh, taking something from your office. And the therapist said, like, I'm so glad you told me that. Let's talk about that. What did I do last week that made you feel that I had treated you unfairly? And so you go back to that original source and you heal from, from those experiences. Now, that can be very tough work. It's not easy. Any personality disorder work is tough. No pain, no gain sort of a thing. You have to experience the anxiety of extending yourself beyond your comfort zone. But that's the only way to heal. But again, with the good enough therapist, someone who knows what they're doing, and again, they're in the minority. Because if you just went to a random therapist, my guess is they would have no idea what I'm talking about. Not because I'm super awesome, but because of the training of therapists is done in such a way that doesn't sometimes even touch on these issues and continuing education included. Uh, So if you just went to a random therapist, they would probably 
uh, I, if you said I have an issue with thieving, they would say like, they would just go on some sort of behavior mod system or some kind of addiction model to get you off of that uh, behavior, which might actually work. But again, if you don't treat the underlying cause of the passive aggressive personality and the relational traumas you went through and the deep unfairness that you went through as a child, then although the thieving might go away, the passive aggressive urge will just transform to some other behavior, some other dysfunctional behavior in all likelihood. So, so not only would the therapist not be great to do that, but also if you did say that to a therapist, like I'm thinking about stealing something from your office, some therapists might actually be quite offended and upset at you and actually just fire you as, as a client. I, I get so many emails from listeners who have experiences that are akin to that, that I, I just, so I, I, I would, so what would I say in terms of advice about how do you suss out the right therapist? I would ask around for a relational therapist, but that definitely, or psychodynamic interpersonal, but that definitely doesn't guarantee at all. I would also say how, how do they treat borderline? Cause that's a common thing that people should know about. And cause if they're, if they're good at treating borderline, I would suspect you're 95% sure that they're also good at treating passive aggressive, even if they don't even know what passive aggressive is. Because again, it's, it was excluded from the DSM uh, recently. So it's not even a thing in the official DSM anymore. But anyway, um, so that's what I would do. I, I would, I would ask them, how do they treat borderline? And then if, if they say, well, I don't believe in borderline, then I wouldn't work with them. But if they say, well, when I work with borderline, I know that the relationship is very important. And I know that uh, being a stable attachment figure is very important. And I know that um, there's going to be some feelings and we'll, we'll just have to work through those. Like th those would be things that if I heard that, I'd be like, okay, there's a chance that this person is going to work out. But, you know, you just never know. You have to you have to work with them for a bit before you can really know that. So anonymous patron, I uh, let me know what you think about all this and um, also keep me updated because I think you deserve the treatment that you deserve. And, um, tr and the other thing I'll say to this is that after it takes a while, so it's going to be years of therapy could be, could be three years, could be 20 years. I've seen that before. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as, you know, we have some form of healthcare and let's hope the government does something about that, then you will get the treatment that you'll have access to the treatment that you need. Hopefully, God, I don't know. But anyway, so hopefully you have access to mental health care. My God, I can't believe I have to say that in today's world, but um, it could take a long time. But as you go through the steps of therapy, it does get better for sure. I've treated people with passive aggressive. I treated people with many personality disorders and seen gradual success over time. Uh, borderline, narcissistic, antisocial, passive aggressive, histrionic, uh, dependent personality, all those schizoid, all those. I, I, I've treated one person with schizotypal and I think I got somewhere kind of, um, but treatment had to end for a random reason. Schizotypal is kind of a rare thing that therapists in private practice will see. But anyway, my point is, is that it can work. And the one of the only paths to getting better is through a therapist that knows what they're doing. And if you're a therapist out there, I hope you're listening too, because some of these people might come in your door. And so it's important to know. And I know some of you really already do know all this stuff. So I'm preaching to the choir, but, um, and so imagine an anonymous patron, a world in which you really don't have any urge to, to thieve. You have better self-esteem. You, uh, have healed from your attachment issues. You, you trust other people. You express anger in an assertive way. You have close relationships with people, uh, and r romantic relationships that are mutually gratifying and stable and secure and all that just, you know, that is possible with the right treatment. It might take some time, but it's possible. I see people 
who are 55 years old and have been suffering from your condition and having never been to therapy or when they did, it just wasn't really the right situation. And then we begin the healing process at the age of 55. So by, by the time they're 65, they are mostly healed. So if you're young, because I, th I think from your email, it sounded like you were on the younger side, you have so much time ahead of you to actually get the treatment that you need. And it works. I'm telling you, I've seen it. So please, you deserve it. Do it. All right, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. Depending on when this episode comes out, I have a few announcements here. Number one is that Critical Core is now out. If you've been listening to the Dungeons and Dragons episodes, you'll know that we've been pushing Critical Core, which is this box set for therapists and parents and educators to use with their clients and kids and whatnot that is using Dungeons and Dragons for therapeutic, educational, and parenting purposes. And so if you go to criticalcore.org and click on the Kickstarter button, you can uh, become a part of the Kickstarter. We've already passed our uh, goal and the orders just keep coming in. And we've, I don't know, we've managed to get out of thousands of, of uh, orders, which is great. So all this means that um, the product will be even more funded, I suppose, and more likely to be uh, well-produced and well-supported and that kind of thing. So anyway, go to criticalcore.org for that. Another thing is, is that for the podcast on Patreon, I'm starting on June 1st, 19, uh, 2019, June 1st, 2019. I'm starting new tiers, a new tier system. When I first started Patreon four years ago-ish, I basically just picked, so on Patreon, there's different tiers. You, you know, you have the $5 tier and the $20 tier and blah, blah, blah. I just picked random tiers because I really just had no idea what I was doing and I didn't really know what to expect. I actually thought no one would become a patron because that's just how I felt about myself back then. <laughs> and so uh, it's been four years and so I thought we would revise those. And as some of you know, I, I have been involving my wife on the podcast. She's now uh, involved in all those, you know, extra things like Patreon stuff and Twitter and and um, Discord, we, we started a Discord. And so she suggested that we uh, update the tiers a little bit. So I'm updating the tiers. Okay, so the different tiers are, we're gonna have a $5 tier and that's just gonna be normal. It's just gonna be like a regular tier you get. So ever all the tiers you get access to the premium episodes and all that kind of stuff, which is often the, the biggest reason why people become a patron. At $10, you get stickers and a card in the mail from us. Um, and and by the way, the, the further up in the tiers you get, the more likely I am to respond to your email. This isn't because I wanna be a dick about it. It's because I'm getting more and more emails as the podcast becomes more and more popular. And in the beginning, I would answer every single email I got on, on the air <laughs> in the first few years. Like any, I remember I'd get an email like once every nine months or something. <laughs> and so any email, I was just like, look, someone's listening and they decided to write in. So it's been a, you know, a curve ever since then. And we're at the point now where I, there's no way I could answer every uh, message uh, let alone on the podcast. And so I'm trying to prioritize somehow. And it just seems like the only way I could really prioritize is if the higher tiers were the ones who got it. So so that's one benefit that sort of is for all the higher tiers. But anyway, at $10, you get stickers and you get a, a card in the mail from us. It's pretty, we have a number of different psychology and Seattle stickers. At 25, you get a mug. So it used to be 20. And so now it's going to be 25. At 45, you're going to get one hour of consultation with yours truly. Now it's 35. So, and a lot of people have been signing up at that. But as I think about it more and more, uh, if more and more people sign up for that $35 tier with one hour of consultation with me, I won't have enough hours in the day to do that kind of stuff. And so uh, we're going to raise it up to 45. Um, and the reason for that is that even if a lot of people still sign up for it, it justifies me taking time away from essentially I have to cut back on my practice is the, this podcast is invading my practice time. <laughs> 
my, my time at the university as a professor can't really be invaded on because that's just a set amount of hours per week. But the one thing that I, I do have flexible time with is my private practice with my clients and my private practice with my supervisees. And so I can actually take fewer clients and fewer supervisees and work on this podcast more. And so in order for me to justify that loss in income, I have to get income from somewhere else. And so if uh, you be, so that's why, you know, that's why I do Patreon um, at all. It's the only reason really. Um, Anyway, and as a result of being able to do that, as a lot of people becoming patrons, I have been able to dedicate a good amount of my time every week to the podcast, which has resulted in, I think, the podcast becoming a lot better. <laughs> when I listen to old episodes, I'm just like, man, I did not have, I did not dedicate enough time to that topic. <laughs> you know, I recently did a 17 hour deep dive on attachment theory. Well, that was 17 hours of recording spread out over a few weeks, by the way, because, you know, you can't record 17 hours straight, right? The other thing is it took me like four months of like um, probably 15 hours a week on average to prepare for it. Just 15 hours a week of me just sitting in front of my computer and reading research. Anyway, so when you become a patron, it really helps allow that. Anyway, so you got the $5 level, the $10 level is the stickers, 25 is the mug, and 45 is the one hour consultation. Um, for the mug and the consultation, it might take a couple months for us to actually get the mug to you or to get the consultation to you because it just takes a little bit to, you know, kind of schedule that and figure it out. Um, but if you are one of those, if you're at one of those tiers and you don't get that goodie, uh, by a certain point, I don't know, like three or four months by, by all means, reach out to me and because um, sometimes something falls through the cracks. And so we just want to make sure that everyone gets what they need. Also, on Patreon, if you want these things, you have to have your you have to include your address on your account because some people don't have their address for whatever reason. And so uh, and that if you don't want these things. So some people are, you know, I'm a twenty five dollar patron, but I don't need the mug. I'm fine without it. Then then they just leave their address off. And that's fine, too. Anyway. The other thing I want to talk about is on Patreon. So all that is going into effect June 1. So so up until that point, the old tiers are going to remain, uh, which are lower than that. So once June 1st happens, then there's a whole new different tier system that will kick in. The other thing I want to talk about uh, is that we've reached a, a, another goal on Patreon, which was amazing. <laughs> um you know, the, we, every goal basically involves some amount of money to charity. We've given thousands of dollars to help animals and students in need, LGBTQ youth, the homeless, etc. Well, we just reached another goal, and so we're going to offer our second scholarship, and this time it's going to be more money. It's going to be $2,500. So we're going to offer another $2,000, $2,500 scholarship and we will announce the details in the future. But if you're thinking about applying, um, you know, start thinking about that now, I guess. Mainly it's the essay. That's, that's the main thing we look at. Um, and we have a new goal on Patreon, which we will bump up the dollar amount even more. But this, and this time we'll give some of the money to PetFinder and some of the money on a scholarship. So we'll give $2,000 scholarship and $1,000 to PetFinder. PetFinder is an organization that saves anim- pets from being euthanized. Uh, my pets have come from PetFinder. It's a wonderful organization with a lot of volunteers, people who volunteer their houses and their time to foster all these animals and to drive them around and connect them with people. So PetFinder.com, you go there and you you can just browse all these animals, all these pets. And like when you get the one you like, then you say, I want this one. And then you, you know, you figure out a situation. Um so anyway, we're going to give, so the new goal, once we get to the new goal on Patreon, um, we're gonna, so if you're thinking about becoming a patron, that's just another thing you can know that the money you give, uh, a lot of it goes towards these really important charities that I think are actually doing real work. You know, we just gave a $2,000 scholarship to someone who was going to have to drop out of her PsyD program because she couldn't afford her tuition like that was due that month or something and 
Um, and she's doing wonderful work in the community already, and she's going to do so much great work. And so um, if you want to read about her profile, go to Facebook. You probably have to scroll down a little bit, maybe to February or early March. And um, her whole, I wrote a whole write-up about her. She's great. Anyway, let's go on to another email. What do you say? Okay, this next email is from Patron Kelly. Patron Kelly is from the Rainbow Region of Australia. She wanted me to say that. Rainbow Region in Australia. That sounds like a fantastic place. She writes, "My par- uh, By the way, when you write me, it's best if you go to our website and use the form because it asks all the important questions like your gender pronoun and how you want me to refer to you, whether it's anonymous or not, and blah, blah, blah. So go to our website, go to the contact us page. That's what Patron Kelly did. Patron Kelly says, my partner and I met seven years ago and he told me he had depression. I have struggled my whole life with mental mental health issues. So I naively thought I could help him with the knowledge I had accumulated over the years, but nothing has helped him much. And when I try to tell him that he should try therapy again, he says he's tried it before, but only a handful of sessions with one psychologist and one session with another. He claims straight away that it won't work. When I say he should try to put his resume out there to get jobs and see if anything sticks, he says it won't work and he has no skills. When I've said he should sign up for a temp agency job to see if any appropriate jobs come up, he says it won't work. He hates being alive and he would like to not exist. It feels like such a waste of a life when there are things that are proven to help. It also makes my life worse. I don't feel like I can grow and improve with this person when he's stagnant and so negative. I want to grow old with this person, but how much can I go through before it's too much on me and I should leave for my own mental health? I feel like my emotions and problems are dismissed because he's so consumed with his own pain. How can anybody get better if they constantly think so negatively? Is there anything I can do to help him improve his life? Would therapy even help? So, and that's the end of the email. So this is a tough situation. Having a spouse with depression is really, really, really tough. Often because the depression is tough in and of itself, but it often is chronic. Even if, even if people are going through treatment, it's, it usually comes and goes. I've worked with people who are suicidal basically every day of their entire life, even though they're not at risk. At, at best, they're, you know, they, they get to a really good place, and I'll ask them, so it's, well, how's your suicidality doing? Thinking that it'll, they'll say, oh, I haven't thought about suicide um, you know, because my life has been going so well. And they'll say, well, I, I still think about suicide. So they're... When people are depressed in this way, it, it's really depressing, frankly, to observe because it can be just so unrelenting and so difficult and so consuming and sticks around even after things are getting better. It's, it's really just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch your loved ones suffer and to beat themselves up and to have this chronic condition. It's, it's, just, it's really heartbreaking. And also, as you said, they sometimes, due to their massive pain and uh, difficulties they're going through, they don't have a lot of capacity or energy to care about you. They don't have a lot of ability. Sometimes they, th- they have such low self-esteem, they actually think they, they aren't worthy of taking care of you. They aren't worthy of your love. And so they'll just isolate in their bedroom all day or something. So... Yeah, it's tough, man. Depression is really, really rough. It's no joke. It's not just kind of being in a bad mood. It is chronic. It is unrelenting. It is, it's tough. Um, But there are paths to healing. Obviously, medication can help a lot of people. People who suffer from the kind of depression that you're describing that your spouse has often will respond if it's going to respond to anything, it often can respond well to medication. So I would definitely consider that. And through psychotherapy, that can help with attachment injuries or 
whatever it is, it is the underlying reason, right? You could have attachment problems. You could have suppressed anger. That's because when we suppress our anger, we have to put it somewhere. And sometimes we put it on ourselves, which can look like depression. Trauma, being traumatized as a child and needing to recover can produce depression. A model of the self that is very negative can cause depression as well. And therapy can help with that. But there's a lot of really depressing barriers to this. For example, men are socialized to be independent and to not ask for help. And so when a man is depressed, they're much less likely to go to therapy because they don't think that they should ask for help. They don't think that help is actually possible. You know, when you're raised as a, as a boy uh, in a very mainstream, genderized way, you're taught not only that you shouldn't ask for help, but you're also taught that asking for help doesn't actually do anything because people either told you to man up or they just thought, well, you just need to walk it off or something. And so not only, um, you know, so there's just a lot of different negative messages about men seeking help. And so that's a massive barrier to depressed men getting help. Also, if you've had difficulties with therapists in the past or they didn't go quite so well, you could have this idea that therapists are bad and that they sh shouldn't go there. Also, more importantly, really, is it's a catch-22 because the more depressed you are, the more you need help. But the more depressed you are, the more likely you're going to be severely pessimistic and lack motivation at all. So in order to go to a therapist, you have to believe that it's going to help, right? Well, when you're depressed, you're pessimistic about everything. You don't think anything's going to work. You're hopeless. You're like, well, you know, the definition of hopeless is that you're hopeless. You have no hope. And in order to go to therapy, you have to have some hope. Also, in order to go to therapy, you have to have some motivation. And if you can't motivate to get out of bed in the morning to even take a shower or to eat breakfast, then going, you know, making an appointment, getting in your car, driving to this stranger's office and talking to him for an hour is going to be a stretch for one's motivation, right? So it's a really tough, tough situation for people. That's why often I will start people with meds because it, you know, that, ta that takes less motivation because you just get assessed for 15 minutes, you get a script and then you take some pills home, you try it once. It doesn't take much to pop a pill every day. And so, even, even though the response rate is pretty low, it's worth a shot. And the side effects are usually not very bad. Uh, not always, of course, but uh, it's like, well, let's just see if that works. Because for some people, like, I don't know, 5% of people, they take that pill and man, it just, that's all they need. Boom, they're back to normal. And they're just like, man, I can't, I can't believe how great this drug is. It's not common, but uh, it can help for sure. So yeah, it's tough, tough, rough situation all the way around. And I, you know, I feel your pain on this uh, patron from the Rainbow Coast. I just imagine, so that's ironic, right? You live in the Rainbow Coast and you have a very depressed person who lives there. Um, you ask, is there anything you can do? Well, the first thing I would do is I would find a group either in person or online for spouses of people with depression. Because there are so many people in your shoes, there are lots of support groups out there. Um, I don't know if there are any in your area, but there definitely are online. I, I'm, I'm sure there's a subreddit for this. So I would seek that out for sure. I mean, just how common is it? Well, 7% of adults in the United States, but probably 7% of adults around the world currently have depression you know, 7%, that's not like lifetime prevalence, that's currently, lifetime prevalence is probably double that. 7% of adults right now are suffering from major depressive disorder. Major depression is no joke. It's not just kind of depressed, right? It's major depression. It's awful. It's what you're describing in your spouse. 7% of adults, that's half a billion people on the planet. Just think about that. 500 million human beings on the planet right now currently suffering from depression, the vast majority of which don't even know that treatment is available, let alone do they are they getting treatment. And in many places, there is no treatment. So that means that if, you know, we just take a rough estimate of how many of those people are in relationships, that's, you know, three to 400 million spouses 
walking around with depressed, majorly depressed spouses. So you know, let's just say 300 million people are around the planet are just like you and asking the same questions. So definitely hook up with other people because in these groups, there will be more advanced members who have better things to say. They'll have more tips. You know, they'll, they'll say, well, this is what I do here. This is what I do. But another major part of these groups is getting support. There is nothing like getting support from people who know exactly what you're going through and are going through it themselves. All you have to do, again, is go to these very specific uh, subreddits and find these sort of micro worlds and how interesting it is to read people's comments to each other because it's so specific. You know, it's not just, it's not like the general statements I'm saying right now. It's, it's, you know, I went through exactly what you went through and da, 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 you know, they'll tell a story and you'll just be like, Oh my God, like, that's exactly my story. This is amazing. In fact, some of the listeners out there with depressed spouses are listening to your story and like, Oh my God, that's my life right now. And so, and that's a powerful emotional thing is to get that. So, you know, maybe you already are getting that, but I, I would make sure you get that. Um, the other thing is, is to have support in your real life. That's a very important thing because your spouse is depressed. They're not going to have the capacity to take care of you in the way that you deserve. And so it's important to get that care from other relationships. Also know the signs of, of suicide. It's a reality. Uh, your husband sounds like he probably thinks about suicide. I mean, you kind of mentioned that a little bit. And the level of depression that he has, particularly when men aren't being uh, effective at work, they're really likely to have a high risk of suicide. And men, as we know, according to my long deep dive on depression and suicide, are very effective at killing themselves when they, when they put their mind to it. So it's important to uh, know the signs of suicide and to do something about it because it's often preventable and often, almost all the time, the individual who is quote unquote prevented from suicide later is th thanking everyone saying, thank you for helping me during that difficult time when I had a spike in suicidality. Um, also, you know, if you want, I would keep encouraging him to go to treatment. Um, but I would do so in a really gentle way. And I would really try to avoid developing a mom son dynamic. I treat a lot of couples and I often, and, and this happens with individual clients, I can detect it in them too. They, a lot of couples like this will come into therapy and I will notice that uh, one, one spouse is obviously the parent and the other spouse is obviously the child, even though they haven't officially said that. And that is a dynamic that you do not want for a number of reasons that I won't go into. But um, so for example, if you're pressuring him to get a job or you're pressuring him to go to treatment because you care and it's, and you're even saying nice things like treatment will help you and you deserve to get treatment and you should put your resume out there because you're a good person and people would be lucky to hire you. And maybe if you got out there and worked, it would get you feeling better about your life and you'd be less depressed and it would just cause this cascade. You know, it's all good advice. It's, it's good things to say. But imagine you're saying that and you're just getting this sense like you're talking to a teenage boy and trying to get him out there to get a job. And that, that's the, what the vibe feels like to you. And he's not saying, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, thanks for reminding me. He's sort of looking at you, resenting you secretly for the fact that you keep badgering him about this. Then I would just stop. I'd be like, okay, uh, I need to stop this. I'm, and if you wanted to, you could just put a, just put a closure to it and say, okay, I, I'm getting the sense like, you're not really appreciating my unsolicited advice. Um, so I'll stop, but just let it be known that I care about you and I'm here to help. And if there's anything you want me to do to help you, I, I will absolutely do it. But I, I know that it, it seems to either not be effective or at the very least annoy you that I'm um, badgering you all the time about this or that. And I'll, I'll just stop that because that's, you know, you're a grown man and it's not my job to do that. Sometimes in very rare cases, that will actually be the catalyst that the person will get better because sometimes people stay 
in that state because they feel sort of beaten down by the rhetoric of their spouse. Uh, addiction can work this way too. When you when you as a spouse are giving the vibe like you have to give the other person advice, it gives the impression to the other person that they are incompetent, that they don't have their own ability to do things. You can actually do this to your teenagers too, by the way. If you're constantly telling your teenager to do their homework, like, let me just use that example. So let's say you have a kid who struggles a little bit with homework. And every day you're just like, did you do your homework? Did you do your homework? You need to do your homework, you know? And if you don't do your homework, you're not going to pass the class. You know, you're just, you say that over and over again every day. Well, you're not wrong in saying that, right? And you could say that some of it is, is probably justified. But what the message that the child will get over time is that my parent sees me as someone who can't think for themselves and has to uh, rely on someone else to tell me what to, I must be so incompetent or my parent sees me as so incompetent that they have to badger me all the time to do something other because because my parent believes that I won't do it on my own. And so over time, it's sort of like a form of invasive enmeshment abuse. And over time, the child just begins to internalize that idea and just be like, oh, I'm incompetent. And so even when you do let go of the reins, the child can't do anything because they have this internalized notion that they're completely incompetent and they can't self-generate any agency. And so with your spouse, you don't want to get into that dynamic. It's not healthy. And the, the question you want to ask yourself is, when I'm giving him this unsolicited advice, does he appreciate it? Because if you can't say yes to that, to that question, then I would seriously consider stop stopping or, or taking a completely different attack with, with your spouse. Um, when we give advice to people, it's important that we make sure that at the very least, they're neutral about us giving them unsolicited advice. And at best, they actually appreciate it. But if they're secretly resenting and, and defending against what we're saying, it doesn't create a very good scenario. Now, if they're a child, that's a whole different thing. Um, you know, children often don't want our quote unquote advice. But, um, but anyway, the point is, is just think about that because that can be, that could actually be one of the factors in his depression, who knows. Um, but anyway, the main thing is, is the first step is getting help yourself. Cause it sounds like you're really in a bind here. So make sure that you get, you, you could go to a therapist too. People come to me to talk about their depressed spouses for sure. And we talk about tips and I give support and we talk about, um, what the, so, so if you came to me, um, I would be, I, we would be talking about all this week to week. You'd be like, okay, so our, how does he respond to your advice? Is that helping? You know, what, it, it just sort of problem solving all that anyway. All right, let's read another email. All right, this next email is from patron Beata or Bita from Belgium. You have the same name as my great, great grandmother who was from Sweden. She came over in the mid 1800s to Kansas and was a Swedish woman, <laughs> and I have a picture of her. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me know how you pronounce it, because I've always wanted to know. Beata? Bita? Anyway, uh, you ask, could you do a show about the Netflix show You, if you've watched it, um, the Netflix show called You? Uh, I haven't seen it. I've heard of it. People have suggested we talk about it. Uh for some reason, the previews don't really appeal to me. I'm not, I can't remember why it didn't appeal to me, but I don't know. I'll add it to the list. Um, you also ask, could you make a video about losing a sibling, mainly as a child, teen, or young adult? My 20 year old, my 20 year old, 26 year old, my 26 year old sister was hit by a bus in December. Oh my God. I am 23. I lost my dad when I was five, but. This one is so much harder. Death seems so much harder to overcome. I feel like very few people around me understand what I'm going through. End of email. Yeah, grief is tough. Loss is the worst. It's terrible. I had to put my cat down a year and a month ago. And every day I think about my cat. And, uh, you know, I have his ashes 
in my office. I can see him right now. And the vet took little paw prints of, you know, on this little clay thing uh, just before they put him down. And it's um, awful. It's the worst. There's no, there's no getting over it. Um, and people, you, so you're, you're, you know, you're saying, I feel like very few people around me understand what I'm going through. Yeah, that's a universal experience. Lots of people don't get it uh, for various reasons. One, our society doesn't get it. And so therefore people don't get it. Our society teaches everyone that grief should be nothing or within a very narrow band of acceptance or something. And so there's, there's no protocol. There's no messages to teach anybody anything. Um, also, people, because of society, don't know what to do. So you might actually have people around you who care a lot, but they actually don't know what to do because society doesn't teach people what to do. Like um, Ocasio-Cortez, our politician, was uh, Twitter shaming people for using the phrase uh, thoughts and prayers. And, it's, you know, you'll see this happen. People will be like, um, you know, uh, don't say thoughts and prayers. And it's like, well... What else are people supposed to do in this society when they're not allowed to do much? And so sometimes now, sometimes if they're saying thoughts and prayers and that's all, and they're a politician and that's all they're doing and they don't actually do anything with the government to actually prevent this from happening again, then by all means, and that was what Ocasio-Cortez was actually criticizing. Great, but stick it to that. Don't say, don't shame people first. And I don't, re I don't know her actual tweets, so I could be talking. I probably am out of my ass. But anyway, I do hear people around me uh, saying things like, um, they will shame people for saying things like, you know, someone will die, you know, say someone's mother dies. And then um, uh, someone will come up to them and they'll be like, um, man, you know, I know what you're going through. Uh, and the person will be like, stop saying, I know what you're going through. You, you don't know shit about what I'm going through, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, you know, I, I get that you don't want that to be the only message, but sometimes people, they don't know what to say. And so there's so few options available, especially if they're not a therapist or a person who studies death and grief and loss then sometimes they're just saying what they think they're supposed to say. And so, you know, let that happen and then try to engage a little bit further into the thing. Anyway, my point is, is that our society is really, really silly about grief. It's just about as silly as we are about sexuality. And so it makes sense that people around you at the very least seem like they don't get it, but they often also won't get it. Sometimes a lot of people, when you go through, you know, your sister just died, a, you know, a few months ago um, in this very traumatic way, by the way, very sudden gets hit, hits by a bus. So it's just awful. And you, you will, I'm sure you've already realized who was your real friend and who wasn't because your so-called friends will just like stop contacting you. Your real friends will keep reaching out. The other, the other test this is, is which, who among your friends and family know about grief, have been through it themselves. I, a friend of mine recently went through a big loss and she was telling me about how she um, realized who among her friend group had been through a similar loss because those people would actually reach out in this very meaningful way. They wouldn't just say, hey, let me know if you need anything or, oh my God, I'm so sorry, or how you doing? They wouldn't, you know, that's what her other friends would do, which is nice. But her real friends would say, I'm coming over or, um, or not real friends and or people who have been through it before. I'm coming over or um, they might write a really long card, even like six months later, they might just write a really long card and send the card and it'll be like, um, you know, very heartfelt and lots of self-disclosure and lots of care and all that kind of stuff. It's not just like, um, you know, tell me what you're up to or whatever. Um, so anyway, my point is, is that I sympathize with the problem you're going through because it's really common for people to feel like they're isolated when they're going through grief. The other thing is, is to don't think about it as overcoming. You're saying, you know, death seems so hard to overcome now. And 
stop thinking about it that way. We, we can't overcome our loss in life. We can't overcome grief. We need to live in the grief. There, there's no getting rid of it. You'll, you'll, you'll likely be grieving for the rest of your life about your sister. It's, it's not something you'll ever quote unquote get over. You know, my grief about my cat, for example, among other griefs of my life, I don't expect myself to get over it. I don't expect myself to not occasionally cry about it, to not occasionally obsess about it, to not occasionally be angry about it and, or to beat myself up about it somehow. You know, uh, that's grief and it's not good. There's, there's some good things that emerge out of grief for sure, but there are bad things about grief. And so number one is you just have to accept that. That's, the, that's your life now. Now, I'm not saying it's not going to get better. I'm not saying it's, it's not, there's not something to do. But often with the way that you're wording your email, I suspect that you're struggling with the acceptance that you're just going to be grieving. And that's just how it is. And I find that for younger people in particular, but older, for older people too, it's harder to accept this kind of reality. You know, when you're, you're, you're 23 years old, um, now you've had to deal with the reality of your dad dying, but like you said, you were younger then and it was somehow felt easier or something, and which is, can be common for people, uh, remembering anyway. There's, there's some kind of loss of innocence when you go through your first major loss and realize, oh, life is, life involves suffering and life involves ongoing suffering that can't be seen by other people. And so I accept that that is, that's what's happening. The other thing to think about is to think about the, the only, there's no stages to grief. There's, uh, an, there's no five stages of grief. That's all BS. Um, the only empirical observation of grief that has been found is that we have what we call a dual process, what they call a dual process of, of grief, which is that there are times when you're grieving and there are times when you're rebuilding. When you're rebuilding, you're not grieving. You're not thinking about it. You're moving on with your life, so to speak. You're, um, you know, you're living your life. And then the other state is the state of grieving, which is reminiscing, feeling, crying, talking, um, remembering, all that kind of stuff. And so what I always tell people, therapists included, when working with grieving clients is to intuit for yourself which mode you're, you need to be in in that moment in a healthy way. So figure out, okay, right now I, I, my body needs to grieve. And I don't know how long that's going to last, but I need to do that. And so you might have to take time off work or you might have to tell your boss, look, I'm grieving right now. I, I'm not going to be that effective because I, I can't even sleep at night. So in that grief process, it could be a long time or it could just be a couple days or it could just be a couple, couple hours. Who knows? But um, be in that space. But also know that your natural body, if you grieve healthy enough and get enough support, by the way, from other people, then your body will naturally vacillate to the other state, which is a state of rebuilding, which is a state that you're not going to be crying necessarily. And you're, you're going to be quote unquote, moving on, but you're not really moving on because it's just a matter of time before you vacillate back to the grieving state. Now, people will interpret this as like backsliding or something because our society shames emotions and shames grief and feelings and crying and reminiscing is seen as, you know, uh, uh, obsessing about the past, holding on to the past, um, letting your feelings get the best of you. All this is just complete effing bullshit, by the way. Nothing makes me more angry than this notion that's in our society. It's just the dumbest, stupidest thing. You know, imagine if a parent did this to a child. Imagine a child uh, is four years old and um, they fell off of the slide and, and they, their knee is bleeding and they're crying and they're like, oh my, this is hurts. And you're just like, stop it. Stop crying. Stop having feelings. If, if any of us watched that interaction, you would go up to that parent and slap him across the face, right? You should, 
I'm not advocating violence, but metaphorically speaking, right? Well, in the same way, when we have a society that tells people like you, patron, to stop having feelings and you've internalized that message and now you're beating yourself up for having feelings, um, you know, we should slap society across the face metaphorically because you couldn't do it physically anyway because society isn't a human being. Anyway, the other thing is, as I've been saying, is it takes time. It takes a long time. I'm grieving things that happened decades ago. <laughs> and and I accepted a long time ago for myself and upon doing research on grief and working with a lot of people who grieve that it's just my life now. You know, Every, I just know. And in the beginning, I used to fight it. I used to be like, why am I holding on to this? This is stupid. You know, just let it go. But I learned a long time ago, like, that's not possible. And it sucks, man. It, there, there is nothing good about that. Like, when certain griefs pop into my head and, and get in my mind and make me feel bad, there's a small part of me that kicks in. And it's just like, stop it. Why are you doing that to yourself? Um, well, of course, I'm not doing it voluntarily. <laughs> and if, believe me, if I could just turn those feelings off, I would have. I'm not... There's nothing about me. There's nothing broken about me. It's just how life is. And this is why older people often become depressed because they have these compounding griefs that just sort of ca catch up with them. And our society doesn't um, help. Anyway, so uh, accept th that it sucks. Be in the grieving process when it's happening when your body wants to go there, get support, F find those friends who are real friends. And who like when I was 23, I would venture to say the vast majority of my friends were not even mature enough to take care of me as as I was going through a grief. In fact, <laughs> I don't think I've ever talked about this on the podcast before. But when I was 19, I was experiencing emotional concerns, nothing pathological really, but I was just like, man, I have a lot of emotions. And I had very close friends. I, I had friends that, and still do, that I went to preschool with. I was living with, um, in college, I was living with friends that I had gone to preschool and kindergarten with. I mean, these were, and we were very close friends. And so I would go to them and I'd be like, hey, I'm going through emotional stuff. Can I talk about it? And I, it just never felt very supportive. Because, you know, they're 19-year-old guys. <laughs> Not that they're incapable of empathy or something, but, well, maybe they are. Anyway, the point is, is that it wasn't working. So I was talking with another friend of mine who's actually a politician now, and he said that University of Washington has this thing called Hall Health, which has therapy for only $15 a session, and you just go down there and you set an appointment. So I did that, and it helped. Um, the therapist was very psychoanalytic, would sit behind a desk. There was, I would sit on one side of the room. Then on the other side of the room was his desk. And then the therapist was behind the desk. So <laughs> imagine that. And would barely say anything. It was just extremely blank slate-ish and older. He, I wonder if he's still alive. I wonder if I can get access to those files, right? You know, if I went to the... Uh, mental health and asked for my client file. Ooh, I'm going to do that. Anyway, it was, it was helpful. It wasn't extremely helpful and planted a seed that would later bloom into me deciding to become a therapist. Um, all right, let's go on to another email. This is great. I feel like I'm, you know, Marie condoing my, my email list, but, but anyway, in closing, uh, to patron, um, did you give a name? Yeah, Beata from Belgium. Um, take care of yourself. Get support. You deserve that. You deserve to grieve. I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, another complicating factor is that it was so sudden and so violent. When we have violent, sudden losses like that, it, it complicates things, right? Because, it, you know, say she had cancer that lasted for five years and then she died. That's tough too, but you at least have some time to prepare, so to speak, and to say your goodbyes and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, 
So it, it's, it's not going to be an easy road ahead of you, um, but uh, you deserve the support and the self-compassion that you deserve. All right, this next email is from patron Natasha, good old patron Natasha, uh, writes in and says that there is a lot of criticism about Alcoholics Anonymous. Why is there so much criticism about Alcoholics Anonymous? Well, my short answer to this is I have no idea because I consider it very strange. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has helped so many people. Uh, I mean, I get some of the quote unquote criticisms, but there's there's criticisms you can say about therapy. It uh, doesn't mean we need to reject it entirely, right? But yeah, it is weird that uh, there's just a lot of criticism in the public about Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I would venture to say if you just ask the average person about Alcoholics Anonymous, they would be like, oh yeah, isn't that some kind of like terrible thing? Which is very strange to me. Uh, I think part of it might be that there isn't really a very strong lobby for pro-AA um, rhetoric, because AA isn't a for-profit organization or anything. So anyway, um, I think that if I was to speculate as to why the general public it has a very overly, what I would consider to be an overly critical view of Alcoholics Anonymous is that maybe they fear the unknown. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is very specific. There's not a lot of things you can point to that are analogous to it. And so if you've never been, then I'm guessing it can be kind of scary. Um, if you've been, you realize, oh, I, I see the format here. If, I, I've been to a number of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings for various different clinical reasons, and um, I have found them to be delightful for the most part. It's actually a wonderful thing to think about that as a society, we as human beings as a democracy, get together without any um, self-interest, so to speak, without any marketing interest. People just get together and, and facilities will de uh, donate their, their space, like churches and community centers. People will volunteer their time to set up the coffee and the cookies and everything and read the notes at the beginning. Because it's all, if you don't know about Alcoholics Anonymous, there's no leader. There, you know, a lot of times people think that there's going to be like a paid facilitator, like a therapist there or something. And that's not, that's not the case at all. It's, it's completely member run. You know, it's like a co-op. Other alcoholic, you know, people who have been in AA longer, they just sort of volunteer and say, okay, well, I'll run this meeting, which basically just means you read this thing at the beginning and then, which is just like a couple of minutes. And then the rest of it is just this format where everyone just talks if they want to talk. And, and there's no crosstalk. There's no like conversations. People just, um, you know, you're sitting in a circle and uh, if you want to talk, you talk and you can talk for really however long you want to talk. But there's a general kind of format to it that people will talk for five minutes ish or something. And they'll just say things like, so this week I'm sober and I've been doing pretty good, but I've had some urge to drink again. And but I know that that's not a good idea, but I'll tell you, there's a part of me that thinks I should be drinking, but I know when I come here and I talk with you all and I know that you all support me, um, even some of you who I don't even know, I know, <clears throat> I know that we're all here to be sober and I know that we all see the light that our drinking can cause a lot of problems. And so coming to this meeting helps me to solidify my dedication to sobriety. And that's really all that I consider AA to be. I mean, you can get into the 12 steps and all that, <coughs> all that kind of stuff. But really, to me, the, the main helpful mechanism of AA is that when you go, you know, we live in a world where alcohol is everywhere. And so if, if you're trying, it's like trying to be vegan or something in a, in a community that is a lot of meat eaters. You're or being gay in the 80s in any society in the United States, um, you're, you're, you feel alone bec and you feel all this pressure to be the other way because so many people drink, you know, like uh, there's alcohol at work parties and at dinners and socializing. It's just everywhere. And so there's this, it could even be in your own house. I mean, your spouse could be drinking and you're trying to quit. So going to AA is this little oasis where it's like, okay, all of us here are not drinking and we're trying not to drink and we recognize that there are problems with our drinking and 
we're refraining from drinking. And so um, we're all going to do that here. And I hear from the other people that um, there are all these reasons to not drink. And so I, I walk out of this meeting when I go feeling stronger to my dedication to not drink. And without these meetings, I would slowly drift back into the mindset of drinking and then slowly drift back into the lifestyle of drinking. So that's all that AA is. It's not a magical thing. It's just people getting together and inspiring people not to drink that day, you know, one day at a time, that kind of stuff. And there's also emotional components, support components. You get some wisdom from people about like, there's a general way that AA tends to gravitate towards in terms of the way people talk about themselves. They will have a lot of self-compassion, but also a lot of humility. They'll just be like, you know what? I don't always know the right answer. And sometimes I need people to help me. And sometimes I need to, you know, hand myself over to God or I need to hand myself over to the universe or something. And um, so there's something about that mixture of humility and self-compassion and realism and reaching out for help and, you know, putting aside all your pretense and everything, putting aside your narcissism and your self-centeredness. And uh, with all, there's something about that that somehow will, is more likely to help people to quit drinking. So there's, so that's all AA is, but yeah, fear of the unknown. Cause if you don't, if you don't know AA and you don't, you haven't been there in my description, you know, it, it seems strange to you. Then you're just like, well, there's just something kind of fearful to us about unknown things. Also, I think that there's, it's a possible, it's a possibility that there are competing organizations that actually will propagate propaganda about AA because they actually want money. There are treatment centers, for example, that I don't know, might actually want to absorb that customer base and will talk crap about AA. I don't know. I, I haven't really seen that because a lot of treatment centers coordinate with AA, but anyway, uh, there's credit, you know, sometimes people think it looks kind of like a cult because it has elements of a cult, so to speak. And, um, so maybe that's why people don't like it. Uh, people are anti-religion, right? And it can, it can, it's like, well, isn't it a religious thing? Um, another factor that I think people might have in terms of being motivated to diss on AA is that, people with an addiction or people who struggle with addiction might sort of feel judged from afar and might strike back. When people have addiction problems, they will become extremely protective of that addiction because they've learned that when it's threatened, bad things happen for them. Cause usually people are self-medicating for some reason. And when something gets in the way, they'll do a number of different things. But one of the things that they resort to sometimes is hostility I mean, I've experienced this firsthand. Like, I, this was, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. A friend of mine was a chronic marijuana user. And I didn't, I didn't mind. I didn't care. I just thought like, okay, he smokes pot all the time. No biggie. And he was trying to get me to smoke pot with him. And at the time, I wasn't smoking pot. And so I was just like, no, nah, I'm cool. I'm good. And over time he became extremely hostile with me about it. There, there was like at least two or three different incidents where he w became emotionally abusive. I mean, it was like insidious. It was horrible. Like it wasn't just like him being upset. It was like some, he was like attacking me personally. He was berating me essentially for like a couple of hours. And I remember just being so confused. I was like, what's happening right now? <laughs> like, how did we get to this place? And later, looking back, I conceptualized it as I, bec just because I was near him and not using, I was a threat to his addiction, even though I wasn't telling him to not use or getting in the way of him using. The mere idea that I chose not to use was some kind of inkling to his subconscious that he had a problem, and that was a threat, and so he attacked me. Um, so I think sometimes people attack AA because of that, it's just a guess. Also, Alcoholics Anonymous in a lot of circles is, is associated with lower class. It, it's, it's associated with poor people or, you know, homeless people or something. Um, that's ridiculous. The vast majority of people who, who go to AA um, are, um, 
the people who go to AA are exactly like the population of that community. I'll just say that. If you live in a rich community, then AA is populated by rich people. If you live in a poor community, then AA is populated by poor people. If you live in a black community, then the AA is populated by black people. Um, so it's just uh, the way that it is. So to, but it is associated with low class in my experience. And so maybe people hack on it because of that. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Uh, but to get into, to address some of the criticism, you know, is it too religious? Yeah. I mean, it, the, the thing that I'll say at the top of this is that if you don't like AA, if, if you're struggling with alcohol or something and you're thinking, okay, I want to, I want to reduce my drinking or I want to stop drinking or something. And you're just like, eh, AA doesn't appeal to me. It's, it's too religious. Okay, great. Fine. There are plenty of other ways to get help. Um, AA is just one of those ways. Uh, it's not the only way. So if it's too religious for you, great. But in my experience, plenty of atheists can make AA work for them. One, they just sort of ignore all the religious talk or the God talk. And, and in some communities, there's very little of the God talk. Like in Seattle, uh, Seattle is so atheistic that the AA meetings tend to be fairly atheistic just by default. But of course, if you grow up in another community where everyone is very religious, then of course, the religion element of it is going to be more prominent, right? But anyway, uh, so there are plenty of atheists who just sort of ignore the God talk. Uh, but also what they recommend, because they've been dealing with atheists for decades, is what the general message to atheists who have that concern is like, well, just think of it as like a higher power. And they don't need, because they don't say, you know, they, they tend to refer to a higher power, which is more like a very uh, generic term for, which could include God, but it could also include like the universe. It could also include yourself, like your higher self, whatever entity you consider to be uh, of, of transcendence or something. Like it doesn't have to be Jesus or Allah. It could be the universe. It could be yourself. It could be your higher mindedness or something. And so the, but for, you know, one of the hundred elements of AA that members will find is useful is to have some semblance of an idea of a higher uh, entity or higher self that you can, you know, refer to or interact with somehow that somehow helps with sobriety. But plenty of people just completely ignore that whole thing because it's not a major portion of it. Like I said, when you go to these meetings, uh, you sit down and you talk about what's happening for you right then. You're just like, okay, uh, I relapsed last weekend and here's why. And I don't like this, you know? And no one says like, way, you're not talking about your higher power. You need to be taught, you know, uh, anyone who does that, it will be quickly told, no, 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 you don't tell people what to do. <laughs> you don't tell people how they're supposed to do this sort of thing. It's, it's not cool. Um, the other element of AA that I didn't talk about is having a sponsor or having multiple sponsors. So a sponsor is essentially a mentor, and they can be extremely wonderful uh, things in people's lives. When you're at home and you're craving a drink and you don't have any, there's no meetings that are happening right away. You can call your sponsor and your sponsor will be there. Your sponsor will say, okay, I'm coming over. I'm, I'm going to hang out with you and I'm not going to drink with you today. That kind of thing. Um, that's a saying that they say, I'm not going to drink with you today. Uh, so yeah, that, so yeah. Okay. And plus there are also non-religious 12 step groups that you can go to, uh, that, that are explicitly non, non-religious. Sometimes uh, people in my industry will say that science has proven that it's not effective. They'll say like, you know, science has proven that AA is not effective. And actually it's, it's not a very uh, accurate sentence. AA is complicated. It's actually hard to uh, evaluate in the same way that therapy is hard to evaluate because the way that some scientists approach the question is through what, we might call a medical research model. When you have the flu, for example, and you vaccine a population, then you look at two different groups. You look at those who got the vaccine and you look at people who didn't, and then you measure the rates of flu infestation, so to speak, rates of flu, uh, people having the flu 
in those two different groups, right? And then you say, okay, well, this vaccine is effective and this vaccine isn't and that kind of thing. So it's very discreet, right? And it lends that sort of uh, phenomenon, such as the flu and vaccines, lends, lends themselves to that kind of empirical scientific inquiry. But therapy and AA are really not like that because with AA, you have somebody who um, is struggling with internal motivation to quit. So the person, part of them wants to drink and another part of them doesn't want to drink. So when that person is, is given treatment, at, you know, like AA, it depends on the human being and their brain and their thought process and all the things that play into that to change. Whereas when you give people a vaccine, it doesn't depend on a human being's thoughts. You just, the, the human being could hate the vaccine and it will still work for them, right? So when you give AA treatment to a group of people who are struggling with alcohol, with alcohol problems, the people have to, they interact with the process in a very personal way. And so for example, Say you take, uh, you know, 10 people who want to stop drinking, who, who say they want to stop drinking and they're like, okay, I want treatment for my alcoholism. And you're like, okay, uh, all, you know, five of you go to AA and the other five of you don't. Let's see what happens. Well, let's say those five people that you sent to AA, they were really only kind of interested in quitting drinking. Most of them still wants to drink. Well, in that situation, AA is not likely to quote unquote work in that situation because they don't, they don't actually want to quit. There's a, a part of them wants to quit, but not all of them. And so that is a very squishy thing. And there's no way to treat that. There's no way to, there's no pill or no therapy program or no 12 step program that can change someone's mind about something. So that is so when we study the effectiveness and therapy can kind of be the same way, right? Uh, because of various other factors, like often people show up to therapy with multiple different causes of their problem. It's not just like they come, you know, I have panic disorder that is very discreet and I have no other problems in my life. Like people, in my experience, they never come to therapy like that. It's usually like a host of issues that will probably never go away. It's just a matter of managing them. But anyway, so when people go to AA, uh, it, it's not like a flu vaccine. It's not like um, cancer treatment or something. It is, it is a matter of wisdom and convincing and inspiration. And there are so many other factors to alcoholism, uh, trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, loneliness, divorce, um, you know, all those kinds of things. So it, uh, it, to say that it's not effective is a little silly because it certainly is very effective for a lot of people. It, it does work. I, you know, it's hard to figure out to what extent and, and what likelihood, you know, like if you send someone to, a, you know, they're like, I have a problem with alcoholism. Um, and you send them to a, what's the likelihood that AA is going to work within a, you know, set amount of time. Um, it's really hard to know the answer to that question, given all the factors. But therapy is the same way too. Now, having said all that, uh, there are many proponents of AA who will claim very discrete effectiveness rates, like 75% or something. And that is also silly. So people on, people on the proponent side will make very dubious claims. And people on the anti side will also make very dubious claims. So we you just have to keep all that in mind. And remember that this is a, a, a human solution to a very human problem that has no other solution to it. Because that's the other thing to me. It's like, well, okay, since AA isn't effective, great. Well, what is? <laughs> like, what else do we have? I mean, if there was a, a more effective, more sure way to treat alcoholism, then yeah, by all means, let's, let's promote that one. But we don't have one. We just don't. Now, there are other ways, obviously, there are inpatient treatment and therapy can actually help with a specialist in chemical. If, like, for example, at my university, we have a, 
a concentration in chemical dependency for our counselors and family therapists. And so uh, you can absolutely go to therapy with the right person. I've treated people in my private practice with addiction effectively. So uh, w often with the adjunct of 12 step groups, by the way. Um, but uh, so yeah, there, there are other things you do. Sometimes cold turkey, sometimes just going to the wilderness, sometimes um, going to church every day. You know, there's various different ways that people have found to be effective. Um, so it's not like there aren't other ways, but none of those ways are proven, you know, to be highly effective because addiction is tough, man. <laughs> addiction in its real form is extremely tenacious uh, to the point where the vast majority of people never recover. Or I don't know the exact percentage. It, it depends on what sort of um, threshold we have. But in my experience, many, many people just never get sober because it is, or they achieve like occasional kind of sobriety or they sort of cut back to this and that. Um, but anyway, Another criticism is that uh, pe that I hear people say is like, well, you know, aren't people just replacing one addiction with another? Aren't they replacing alcohol addiction with Alcoholics Anonymous addiction? Aren't they aren't they addicted to Alcoholics Anonymous? And you know, that's just silly. People need to stop that nonsense. That's just to how are you addicted to something that is sitting in a circle talking to people? once a week, which is usually what people kind of gravitate to. You know, in the beginning, they recommend you go every day because you're very likely to slip back into use. But after a few months, you can start trickling down to once a week and then maybe once a month or something. Uh, but often it ends up being kind of like once a week. People will find their meeting that they like to go to because meetings are weekly. And so they like to do that. And then they will... Um, really get to know the people and they'll like those individuals and they like that time and they depend on that time. Well, what's wrong with an going one hour on a Thursday night from seven to eight to something like, how is that harming your life? It, it doesn't. So you can't be it. That, that's not an addiction. <laughs> That'd be like saying that, um, you know, okay, someone is addicted to alcohol and they decide that instead of doing alcohol, they're going to go hiking once a week. It's like, oh, well, they're just replacing one addiction with another. Uh, that is silly. You just need to knock it off. Another criticism is that it can be too dogmatic uh, and too rigid. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, AA can absolutely be dogmatic. It, it can absolutely be uh, rigid. Um, you know, some people uh, will, people who go to AA and also some chemical dependency people, when you talk about harm reduction, which I'll get into in a second, when you talk about like just, you know, what, you know, say you're an alcoholic or you have trouble with alcohol and you go to someone with AA and you're just like, well, you know, I want to cut back, but I don't really want to quit entirely. I don't want to let go of alcohol entirely. Is that possible? Well, some people in AA will be like, no, that's not possible. You can't cut back on alcohol. That's just, you're just playing a game with yourself. If, if you allow a little bit of alcohol in your life, it, it will always progress to a problem and you need to get rid of that notion. Well, that's not always true. The data shows that plenty of people can have massive problems with some substance and cut back to a point where it's not so much a problem. I mean, I've seen people even do this with like cocaine. They'll have a problem with cocaine and they will cut back to a point where it's like not that big of a deal, meaning they use it like once every three months and they don't overdo it and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's not um, now for many people, especially people who suffer from addiction, you know, propensities. Uh, it is true that if they let a little bit in, eventually it just becomes a problem again. And abstinence is really the only, only way they can really be healthy. And so, um, so yeah, AA can be too dogmatic for sure. Uh, another thing it can be dogmatic about is they'll say like, it's a disease. You have to see it as a disease. And there are many different models of looking at alcoholism, so to speak. One of the, one of the models is the disease model, but there are many other models. And to say that no other model is worthy is silly. Uh, now, a lot of the dogma 
in Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, de- ha- has been developed in in my estimation because it actually really does help a lot of people to stop drinking. So if you believe that in a very rigid model and you sort of hand yourself over to the AA model and the dogma of that particular group you're in, and they happen to hold the dogma that it's a disease and that um, you can't um, use at all, in all likelihood, that's going to help you because as you head into uh, you know going through the different sort of phases of recovery and, and sobriety, it's going to pop into your head like, well, you know, maybe I just had a problem in the past. Maybe I could drink a little bit right now. And, you know, I know that idea is out there. Um, and then you drink a little bit and boom, you're, you're, you're on a massive binge or something. And, and then later on, you're like, okay, well, if, if I just play all the, a lot of people on their way to sobriety will play these games with themselves. They'll be like, okay, I'm not going to drink wine. I'm only going to drink beer or not. You know, I'm not going to drink, um, I'm not going to drink on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I'll drink on the other. You know, there's all this sort of bargaining that the person deep down knows they're actually playing with fire. Um, well, sometimes it helps to have dogma that says like, nope, that is not an option. A hundred percent, not an option. And so actually that's the fight between the harm reduction people and the, and what I might call the dogmatic, uh, other side of the coin, whatever I want to call that. Cause there are plenty of harm reduction people that go to AA, but anyway, so the harm reduction people will say, cause so that's uh, what they will say is they'll say like, look, it's a matter of reducing harm. It's not a matter of sobriety. It's a matter of reducing harm. Now, sometimes reducing harm means sobriety for sure, but sometimes it doesn't. So what can we do here? And, um, uh, how do we, how do we be more realistic uh, and more tailored to different situations? That's what the harm reduction people will say in general. The, the AA people will, uh, you know, in, in the mainstream AA will say like, nope, that's not an option. And the two people will fight with each other. And I've seen them get in actual like hostile arguments with each other about this. They'll be like, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You're a dogmatic, rigid asshole. I don't know what you're talking about. And to me, I'm just like, you're both right. <laughs> There's wisdom to what you're both saying. You're both trying to help people with their addiction problems. Let's everyone calm down. Uh, you know, mainstream AA person, it is possible that some people can reduce, you know, harm, can reduce their use and still have a healthy life for the most part and not have it develop into a problem. Uh, and to you harm reduction people, it does help for some people to believe that there is no wiggle room there because if there is, if they believe there's wiggle room, then they'll, then they'll fall back into the progressive uh, path towards major use and terribleness and they could die. Um, so you're both right. And, uh, but man, do they fight with each other about that? And there's, and I have seen, I, you know, people who have been in the field a long time in the chemical dependency field, uh, you will often, not all the time, of course, but you will find that they have built up quite a lot of energy around this argument because they've been in so many of these arguments. And that just bringing up the topic, like, hey, you know, what do you think about this? You'll just feel the anger sort of, you know, emerge from them about the whole thing. They'll be like, no, you know. And so it's just a lot of really horrible times and hurt feelings and fear, you know, because the other thing is, is a lot of people, a lot of proponents of AA, a lot of chemical dependency professionals are also recovering themselves and have maybe adaptively adopted the notion that any use is bad use because in their life, if they allow themselves to believe that sometimes it's okay to use, then then that little idea grows into something bigger. And before long, they're, and they've been there before because most people who have uh, recovered have relapsed hundreds of times um, in very horrible ways, very, uh, you know, humiliating ways, shall we say. And so, yeah, it, it can be too dogmatic at times, but I think if it, one I can say is there's not a lot of reason there's, there's, if you hand yourself over to the dogma, it probably won't hurt you. <laughs> you know, sometimes what I tell people is you're, you know, cause people, by the time they go to AA, their life is usually not going well. And so sometimes what I'll tell people is, look, get sober for a year, go to AA, you know, very often. 
at the end of that year, then you once you're so, sober, your body has recovered, your mind has recovered, you're you're beginning sort of the long the long term steps of recovery. Then you can start thinking about the nuances of AA. Then you can start thinking about like, well, I don't like this, you know, or I like this or whatever. Like, fine. Like, there's a time and a place for that. But while you're in the process of trying to quit alcohol and you're in the throes of your addiction, it's probably not the time to debate the nuances of AA and uh, the philosophy of, of recovery and that kind of thing. Now, as clinicians, we have to, we have to be able to um, have that debate ourselves because it will affect the way that we advise people. But anyway, another criticism that I'll hear is people say like, well, you know, I quit and I didn't have to go to any treatment. I just quit cold turkey and moved on. And sometimes it's said with a smug voice and sometimes it's not. But what I'll say is great. Good for you. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm legitimately happy for you that you were able to achieve that. Many people cannot achieve that. Many people, uh, most, if not all addicts, have tried that multiple times. They have just, okay, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to stop this nonsense. And, and they, they try that, and the urge is so strong. Their body reacts in such a way, or their trauma emerges, or their anxiety kicks in, or something. And it's so overwhelming that they can't, they cannot deal with it. And this notion in our society that like all you need is good willpower is ridiculous. It's, we, we have proven through science time and time again that willpower is shit. Willpower might not even really exist. <laughs> the ability, uh, willpower meaning the ability to overcome an urge that is strong is um, nearly impossible for humans to do. It's the same way when people ask me, it's like, oh, you know, can you talk about procrastination? Because I, I, have, a, I have a problem with procrastination. And that, the, no, the notion there is like, well, what do I need to learn so I can like have the willpower to overcome my procrastination? The fact is that's just not possible. It's not possible to exert willpower over something. There are times when you can do that. Like, you know, say you're suffering from alcoholism. There are times when you can exert your willpower and say, okay, I'm not going to drink right now. I'm not going to drink. You, your willpower is winning in that moment, you know, quote unquote, it's winning. But to expect that willpower to uh, uh, sustain its success over time is ridiculous. What we need to do is we need to establish systems around us so that we don't need willpower, like not having booze at home, not going to a bar, hanging out with other sober people, going to AA, uh, reminding yourself of the reasons why uh, sobriety is better, um, telling everyone around you to stop offering you drinks, telling everyone around you that if you're going to go to an event, make sure that it's dry. You know, that is a system where it, it doesn't require you to have willpower because, you know, you're not being tempted as often, right? So, and that goes for any any substance or any, any habit that you want to form, like, like, uh, working out, for example, you, you know, people will often say, Oh, I got to work out more. And it's just like, okay, well, uh, where are you right now? It's like, well, I'm not working out at all. Or I'm going to the gym once every two weeks or something. And it's like, okay. So in your head, you want to, you want to work out every day. Yeah. I need to work out every day. Okay. Well, um, that's not going to work for most people. You can't just like suddenly change your habits overnight. So, it, you have to change, you have to add a whole system into place. Like you might have to cut back on work. You might have to uh, start small, like just do some, just do one thing every day, one exercise every day, and then just slowly, you know, so that you're, you don't need willpower. Um, and that's another thing that I want to slap our society across the face with is willpower isn't a thing. And for, you know, uh, patron Emily out there, maybe we should make a t-shirt about that. All right, let's go on to another email. Okay, this next email is related. It's from an anonymous patron. They write, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on harm reduction versus abstinence-based programs. I work at an abstinence-based treatment program, but find great benefit in using harm reduction with clients in my private practice. I identify as being in recovery from past trauma, but often when I discuss being in recovery with coworkers, they tend to immediately assume I've been in treatment, go to meetings, have a sponsor, etc. In my opinion, the term recovery warrants expansion 
in the mental health community. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, chiming in here. Yeah. But if you say the word recovery, you know, if you're working in an, you say you work at an absence-based treatment program, which I assume is a chemical dependency treatment program. If you use the word recovery, then people are going to assume that you're talking about recovery from substances because that's just the world you live in. So um, I, I think that's a lot to ask them. <laughs> it's sort of like if you, uh, in I guess our world of, of therapy, because it sounds like you're a therapist, if you uh, said something like um, treatment plan or something, we would assume you're talking about a, a, psychothera a psychotherapy treatment plan. I, I don't know. There's just certain worlds where words mean certain things so often that people just assume things. But anyway, um, you also say, it makes it awkward when I even talk about this with colleagues as they view addiction as a disease rather than what current research suggests that addiction is a learned behavior. Um, again, just chiming in here. Uh, again, as I said before, it's just a matter of model, you know? So one can look at addiction as if it were a quote unquote disease, but what is our definition of disease? Um, so there's that. Um, and what's our definition of learned behavior, right? Uh, these are very squishy things. And what people, when they get in these debates, I've, I've, I find it aggravating to me because I'm like, you both don't understand the larger context here that we're talking about a human experience and we have no way of measuring this sort of thing. We just, uh, it, it could be seen as a disease. It, 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 feel, it resonates with a lot of people and it also could be seen as a learned behavior and that resonates with a lot of people. There's, you're both right because there's no concrete answer to that question. It just depends on, on the way you look at it. And for some people, their approach or their life or their experience with addiction absolutely fits within the disease model. And for other people, it absolutely fits in the learning model. And for some people, it's both. And for some people, it's a, a completely different model. For some people, their addiction is seen as a spiritual thing, as a um, battle between good and evil or something. Uh, and they're right too, because it's just a way of narrativizing the, what we're looking at, you know? So, um, and any researcher who's like, uh, therefore the disease model is wrong or something. I, I just find, I just like, why, who cares? <laughs> like it, 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 it'd be the same, you know, as I get into this more, I just realized that there's something about the chemical dependency world that just lends itself to rigidity or something. I think it's because there's such high stakes because people die, you know, from addiction a lot. And it's, it's so hard to treat addiction that, you know, cause in the therapy world, we definitely have the exact same debates. People will say, Oh, cognitive behavioral therapy is the only way to go. And other people are like, no, this is the way there's definitely debates, but it feels, although can be very aggravating to me, it feels so much less intense than in a chemical dependency world. And I, I, like you, anonymous patron, um, have in the past worked in chemical dependency treatment centers where I was the only therapist there. And it was so interesting to just observe the way that everyone interacted and talked. It did lend itself to a fairly rigid way of thinking, which I have to say, they oftentimes were right. The chemical dependency people, so I had a very loose way of looking at clients and by uh, colleagues who in chemical dependency, they had a very rigid way of looking at, just as an example, I had a client who I thought was sober for a long time. Uh, and I was talking with my colleagues and they're like, well, I, I don't think she's sober because this and this and that. And I was just like, what? Like, how do you know? That's silly. Like, you don't know her the way I know her. And after a while, lo and behold, it was discovered like months later that she'd been using the whole time. And I just thought, wow, like, you know, now I have the luxury of doing that because I'm a therapist and I don't need to know if someone's using or not because people come to me with voluntary problems. Um, whereas chemical dependency people often are kind of in a position where they have to detect that sort of thing. But anyway, um, it's also very stressful work too. Uh, I would think on average chemical dependency work is more stressful than uh, especially working in private practice. So when you're stressed out, you know, you kind of get frayed at the edges. With the rest of your email here, 
With my experience of clients in private practice, I've had many people run from 12-step programs saying that they are ashamed and are reluctant to admit that they are powerless in the first step of AA and other programs. When people hesitate to admit powerlessness over the disease, they are then labeled as being in denial. Um, just chime in here. Yeah, that's awful. If someone's, if any expert AA person would say that is unfair. If someone comes to uh, an AA meeting, especially at the beginning, and they're just like, I don't, I don't want to admit that I'm powerless, and I don't even want to see this as a disease. Any good AA member would be like, that's cool. Just keep coming, you know, just keep coming to meetings. Um, you don't have to ever believe that if you don't want to. But um, there's so many other things that we do here. We, you know, we talk about our addiction. We talk about how we suffer in life and how we can support each other. We get spot, you know, there's a lot of other mechanisms. You know, that's the other criticism I find that people will wage against AA is they'll, they'll focus on this one element of AA and they'll just be like, you know, why do I have to admit I'm powerless? And it's like, you don't. I bet you anything there's a, you know, minority of people who love AA and have been going for years and have never truly, quote unquote, admitted that they're powerless, you know, and or admitted that they have a disease. It's just, there's, if you go to AA, so here's another thing I'll say, is that, because I've worked with a lot of addicts over the years and have recommended they go to AA. And what I have found is that just the suggestion of AA is sort of a litmus test to see what percentage someone is to wanting to um, be sober. So like I said, when someone's talking about this, there's a part of them that wants to drink and there's a part of them that doesn't. Um, there's a part of them that wants to use cocaine and there's a part of them that doesn't. And it's a war. Now they might express the side of them that wants to quit. But the other side is there, whether they're talking about it or not. And so when I suggest AA or some other group to them, some other treatment thing, when someone is like, you know, at the 75%, they want to quit, Mark, you know, 75% of them wants to quit, then they're just, then they'll go to AA. And even though they don't like certain elements of it, they'll put up with it. You know, they'll sit in A and they'll be like, well... You know, they'll come back to me and they'll be like, well, yeah, I liked it, but it seemed a little weird. Like, you know, the God thing kind of bothered me. But, you know, overall, I, I, I left feeling a little bit more inspired to not use. And I guess that's good. Um, so I guess I'll keep going. That's what I'll, you know, if someone has any criticism uh, and they really want to quit uh, because they've reached that point in their life, then uh, that's what I'll hear. If someone is like, 20% they want to quit and 80% of them doesn't want to quit. And that, but the 20% is the one that's talking to you in that moment. And you say, okay, we'll go to AA and you know, we'll talk next week. They come back to me. They'll be like, Oh my God, it was so dumb. Like this and this and this and this, they'll just have this litany of, of things that they hated. And, and you know, I'm not in the business of forcing people to do anything. So I'm just like, oh, okay, that's cool. But over time, years of, working with people like this, what I found is that those people who have those massive complaints about AA are usually people who don't actually, they're not at that, they're not at that point yet. They're at a point enough to go to AA, but they're not at a point enough to relax and sort of see the good side of AA. You, you might even say that their addict side is making sure that AA doesn't work, you know? So now, that's that basically is saying what you know is the ridiculous dogma which is uh that if you don't like aa then there's something wrong with you and that's not what i'm saying um what i am saying is that if someone so let me give you a very typical kind of scenario here this person you know they're working with me and they're like okay um you know and they go to AA and they're, they come back to me and they're like, ah, I didn't really like it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a staunch atheist and I don't like any talk about God. Well, in that moment, I, be, I might be like, uh oh, maybe this person isn't really ready to, to, to get sober. You know, I don't know. Um, but then a little later, they're like, okay, I found another group that doesn't talk a lot about God. And so I think that'll, that'll go okay. And you know what? I should probably just go to intensive outpatient. I should probably just pay for a program 
uh, a chemical dependency program and actually just just buck up and go go to one of these things. And then they do that. And then, you know, a few months later, they're like, you know what, I don't think I want, I don't think I like AA. I, it's just, there's certain things about it that I just don't like. Okay. In that scenario, great. You didn't like AA. You, you gave it enough of a shot and you're just like, no, the, the cons outweigh the pros. But often what I'll see is people will go to one meeting and they will determine that all of AA is worthless, which any person who goes to AA would know that's silly. One, the first time you go, you're so terrified. It's such a weird kind of, you know, intimate experience that it, it's hard to know what is happening the first time you go. The other thing is, is that every group is different. I mean, you have groups that are, you know, like I said, there are groups where the, it's, it's 10 black men who smoke cigarettes the entire time. Uh, and they're like all 55 years old. You have another group that are white Christian uh, 18 year old girls who meet in another group. You have another group where it's like a mixture of people. You have another group where it's 200 people in the group. You have another group where it's five people in a group. These are wildly different experiences and each group will have its own culture because it will have a different set of people, which comprises a different system. Um, meetings that meet in the morning before work, you know, a meeting that meets at 630 is going to have a different sort of person than people who meet at like 730, for example. So uh, to say you would go to one meeting, you go like, ah, I hate it. It's like, what? You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It'd be like going to one movie, hating it and saying, I hate all movies <laughs> or watching one TV, watching, you know, one episode of one TV show and going, nope, I give up on TV. Now, it's possible that uh, AA isn't going to work for you, but I, if, if, if someone's struggling, I'm like, look, you need all the help you can get. And unless you have a sure other way of helping you, um, I recommend keep going to AA. It's not, it can't hurt you. So just keep giving it a try and we'll, we'll think about it in a few months. And if you still hate it, then, you know, then you'll know that it's not for you. But one AA meeting doesn't constitute you knowing the situation yet. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, anonymous patron, if, if people are going to AA and they're being shamed, it, that is not the mission of AA. Like I said before, it, it, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the exact, I don't know if it's one of the steps or one of the rules or something, but the, the ones that I've seen, the one, the meetings that I've seen, they actually will say something like, um, we don't judge other people. We don't cross talk. We don't tell the people what to do. Um, in fact, so the times that I've gone, I, I've gone as an observer, but no one knew I was there as an observer. Uh, they uh, probably thought I was a member or someone who was just trying it out for the first time. And at no point did anyone ask me to talk. And at no point did anyone um, give me side glances for not saying anything. It, it's... Um, it, it people who go to AA know that some people just don't want to talk and they know that some people just need time and space and you don't pressure them. Like you just don't, you, cause that's stupid. Now, are there some people at AA who will do that? Absolutely. But like I said, this is a, this is a human organization trying to address a human problem. There's going to be human mistakes being made, but on the whole, that's not, at least the culture that I've seen and the groups that I've gone to oh, a handful of different groups in my clinical life and Al-Anon too, by the way, I've gone to Al-Anon meetings as well. And they're very similar. Um, but anyway, so that's what I'll say to that, but for sure, harm reduction. Absolutely. Um, like I said, for many people, uh, they don't need AA or they can go to harm reduction, 12 step groups or harm reduction groups, you know, there are, there's plenty of, um, uh, options for that. In in my world, there's just a lot of different paths to sobriety. And one of those paths involves Alcoholics Anonymous and many other paths do not, but we shouldn't, uh, shame one of those paths. And, and, and if you're a proponent of one of those paths, you shouldn't shame other paths. That's the whole thing here. Like everyone needs to stop fighting with each other. <laughs> We're all trying to do the same thing and we need to stop confusing the public. We need to tell the public, look, 
AA is great for some people, but it's not for everybody. Uh, uh, there, here are the other options available to you. None of these options are guaranteed to work because science has proven that none of these options work very well, <laughs> you know? Uh, so understand that this is a process. It takes time. It, you know, you, it takes you, it, you are involved in, in the recovery. You have to discover things. You have to grow up. You have to mature. You have to differentiate. You have to work on your family of origin. You have to work at your perspective in life. You have to work at your negativity. You have to work at your attachment behaviors. You have to work on your marriage. You're going to have to work on the way you interact with your parents. You're going to have to work on your grief. Like it's going to involve all that stuff. And um, so get ready because uh, just going to an AA meeting isn't going to solve all that. And no one, no wise person at AA believes that. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Okay, I got through seven of my pages of emails. How, how fun is that? Uh, Marie Kondo up in this biatch. Why did I just say that phrase? That was weird. All right, well, that does it. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. Mm-hmm.